Right, everyone, thank you so much indeed for coming today and for your attention for the next 35 minutes or so while we have a think about the historical context in which Euripides' Bacchae would have been written and also performed. But before we start that, um, I have a quick job to do because I've been asked to give a shout out. Mrs. Spate from Cokethorpe. Hello. Your students have got in touch with me and said how much they love your vocab tests. <laughs> Great job for making a vocab test. So enthralling. Well done, you guys. Can we have a round of applause for Mrs. Spate, please? Right, back to the ancient world. The crucial thing we need to understand is that this play, as you're beginning to realize already, is quite an unusual one. And that applies also to the historical context. Because I said just before, we need to think not just about the historical context of when it was performed, but also when it was written. And those are two different places and two different moments. So we start off thinking about when it was written. Euripides actually writing this play during the final years of his life, not in Athens, but up in Macedon, in northern Greece, in the court of the Macedonian king, Archelaus I. Now, we think he wrote probably the play in about 407, having moved up to Macedon the year before in 408, but he would be dead by 406, and the play would actually then be performed back in Athens produced by, we think, his son, confusingly and annoyingly also called Euripides, in 405. So we have to think about those two different moments. So here's our man, Euripides. And just in case we need to locate ourselves geographically, this might help a little bit. Athens, well, it's in Athena. It's actually a map in a different language. Here's a real test for you before midday on a Friday. Uh, but you can see Macedonia right up at the top uh, there. It's quite a big geographical distance, and there's a much, much bigger cultural distance that we need to think about. So question for us is first, what do we make of Euripides running off to Macedon in the last two years of his career? Now, on the one hand, this can seem like a very, very odd thing to do, because as many of you may be aware, there's a bit of a culture difference between Athens and Macedon. And in fact, this will raise its head just a couple of years after this play has uh, been put on in Athens, when the sophist Thrasymachus will label the Macedonian king Archelaus not a Greek, but a barbarian. Right? Macedon, Macedonia, its king, was not part of the Greek world. It was part of the barbarian other. Right? Now, this is not a new call from that sophist in about 400 BCE, because actually it's a refrain we've heard being echoed throughout the fifth century. If we dial back to 476 BC in the immediate aftermath of the Persian Wars, we'll hear about the Macedonian king Alexander, Alexander I, not Alexander the Great, Alexander I, um, who approached the committee at Olympia asking to be allowed to compete in the Olympic Games. And as many of you may well know, the key rule about being allowed to participate in the Olympic Games was you had to be Greek. He was refused initially, and it was only after some really, really dodgy sort of chronological family tree work proving somehow that he was actually descended from Heracles, that well-known Greek hero, that he was allowed to uh, actually participate. Now, Alexander I was a, quite an odd guy. He, many felt, had been a bit sympathetic to the Persians during the Persian Wars, not exactly going to endear him to the Greeks. And one of the things he did, which I kind of love about him, but underlines how weird and different he was, was that after the Persian Wars, he thought, as many Greek cities did, we better put up a monument to victory over the Persians. And many people did this at the great sanctuary site of Delphi. But whereas other Greeks put up small statue groups or treasure houses. Alexander put up an enormous statue of himself, which you can see here in this model, towering over absolutely everything. A statue of himself made of gold, right? If anything is going to show himself out to be slightly out of step with the culturally Greek way of doing things, this was obviously it. 
But this kind of uneasy relationship between Macedon and Athens that's bubbling through the 5th century doesn't get any necessarily easier. His successor as king, a chap called Perdiccas II, who ruled sort of between, from the middle of the 5th century through to the latter part of the 5th century, he basically was having a lot of internal trouble in Macedon, and so he was a bit withdrawn from affairs in the rest of Greece, except for the fact that as the Peloponnesian War broke out in the second half of the fifth century, he sort of started alternating support for Sparta on the one side and then Athens on the other, and then kind of moving between the two, so not really endearing himself to either. And then his successor would be our man Archelaus I, who would welcome Euripides. Now, this kind of Macedon, Macedon versus the rest of Greece kind of cultural mismatch will echo on through the fourth century. Philip of Macedon, father of Alexander the Great, has similar trouble when he wants to compete at the Olympic Games down in the middle, of the, the, well, the middle and second half of the fourth century BCE. So kind of we can see this is an ongoing thorn in the side. And of course, it's something that has continued to echo down through the centuries even to today. So we have to imagine these are two very different places. Athens, the democracy, the polis par excellence versus Macedon, this rather large and ramshackle collection of tribes with totally different customs and ideas and even to a certain extent language with a very diffuse political sense of community ruled over by a king. In many ways, you couldn't get too many different places and Euripides, of course, moves from one to the other. But as you watch the play this afternoon, just think about that. Euripides' own personal move as he moves from one kind of place, the polis, the city, to the much wider, in some ways, in some eyes, more savage, barbarian, natural, mountainous place of Macedon. And you'll see that tension in the play. But on the other hand, we actually shouldn't think about this as necessarily such a big move uh, for Euripides at all, or at least one that was very opportune that he did at this particular time in 408. Because Archelaus I, despite being labelled a barbarian by another Athenian sophist, was actually all about trying to turn the Macedonian court into a culture centre of the ancient Greek world. Now, he'd been building roads across Macedon, trying to sort of get better systems of communication. He'd moved the capital uh, to Pella, to a new uh, part. You can see Pella up on the map there. Um, and he kind of wanted to make this now a cultural centre. And he'd also been trying to get on better terms with Athens. So just a couple of years before, Euripides would move up there in 410. Um, actually, Athens is helping Archelaus see, seize control of Pydna. You can see up there on the map on the top left. And Archelaus sort of reciprocates by making sure that Athens is supplied with timber for their ships. Quite an important thing when they're in the middle of a great war. And indeed, in 4076, so while Euripides is up, in Macedon, Archelaus will actually be honored by the Athenian assembly as a proxenos, right? um, not one of us, but a friend of us and a benefactor of Athens. Right? So actually there are some moments, this is a moment, this moment sort of 410 to 4876, when Euripides makes this jump, when actually there's a little bit of a rapprochement between the two. So Euripides is not there in, in defiance of Athens, but actually he's capitalizing on a moment of interaction and close co contact, despite this bigger, underlying, continual sort of cultural mismatch and suspicion of Macedon, between Macedon and Athens and others. And in fact, he's not the only one going there. We know that other tragedians, like Agathon, moved at the same time as Euripides. Musicians, other artists, all moved up to Macedon to be part of Archelaus's new cultural center. And here he is, the man himself on his coins. Um, we know that Euripides was very active while he was up there. He's even credited with commissioning and with being commissioned by Archelaus to write a production entitled, what, what do you think it was entitled? What do Macedonian kings like writing about and creating art about? themselves. So the play was entitled Archelaus. Right? So we think about this Macedon as a vibrant society, if a little egotistical, right? uh, with a ruler that's welcoming all of these cultural contacts and creating quite a cultural hive. In fact, Archelaus is building as well. Here's our map just to center ourselves again. Here's Archelaus, um, and we should get here through to the sanctuary of Dion 
that Archelaus is actually building. So he builds a sanctuary of Zeus, a temple of Zeus, and a theater, right? We need a place for all this cultural output, uh, Dion. And the kind of we might imagine the Euripides is presenting some of his tragedies that he writes there. You know, there's some people who even think that potentially even the Bacchae got a showing here before it came down to Athens. Um, and very much, you can imagine, Archelaus wanted to create a kind of cultural center in the north up in Macedon. If he and his forebears were going to be a little bit shunned and made to feel a little bit on the edge at the Olympics, why not create your own kind of cultural and athletic and musical hub and competition up here in Macedon? So Euripides is actually able to benefit from moving out of Athens, which if you imagine in 408 after years of war, was actually a pretty sad and desperate and forlorn place to be. To an entirely new court in the north that was full of money and funding, full of new enterprises, full of cultural uh, highlights, and are now a center attracting these cultural performers from all across Greece. And in fact, many scholars have argued that this is partly responsible for the complete change in tone of the plays that come out of Euripides' years up in Macedon. Think about what he's presenting and writing beforehand, plays like Trojan Women, all about the suffering of war. And now we move into this much more fantastical, mythological world of the Bacchae. Euripides almost gets a second a kind of uh, uh, injection of cultural creativity through his actual move up to the barbarian north. And um, these two were good buddies, you know. Uh, supposedly, they uh, kind of had um, quite a lot of, spent a lot of time in each other's company. Um, and indeed, when one of Archelaus' uh, pages had the temerity to criticize Euripides, we're told by Aristotle that uh, the page was handed over to Euripides for flogging. Sadly, this didn't work out particularly well, so Aristotle tells us the page was really annoyed at this and so started planning to assassinate. Archelaus, the Macedonian king. And then there are some quite sleazy stories about how Euripides actually died up in Macedon. Uh, some, like Diodorus Siclus, tell us that he was torn apart by dogs. Um, but others will tell us that this actually happened while he was on the way home from a dinner party with Archelaus, where a rival for Archelaus's affections was a bit annoyed uh, that Euripides was getting on so well with him and so set his dogs on him. Uh, and there's even later versions um, that tell us uh, that Euripides was on a nocturnal visit to Archelaus's boyfriend when he was attacked by a group of women who tore him to pieces. I think we, this source, the pseudo, might be confusing the play with the reality, but I'll leave that there for you. Okay, so let's just reflect on the fact that Euripides is creating this play while he's up in Macedon. Euripides is the outsider creating a play about an outsider, Dionysus, coming into a new community. So perhaps there is an association here you might want to read in, possible associations between himself, Euripides, and Dionysus, the stranger who brought wisdom and superior knowledge to this court of Thebes in the play. But also I think we do have to see this ongoing tension between the idea of Macedon as the outsider and of Athens and Greece more widely, and their ongoing relationship. But there's also potentially here something about a warning to Archelaus himself. Because we know from other writers like Plato that Archelaus will also be seen in many people's eyes, not as this kind of cultural center point, but actually as a rather autocratic ruler, a vicious man with no legitimate claim to the throne he held, as Plato will respond in the Gorgias. Um, and so perhaps actually this is also a bit of a warning to Archelaus in terms of how Pentheus acts and reacts. So kind of that's what we can say about the time that this is being written in Macedon, about Euripides responding to that moment, the creation of his play, and perhaps something about the possible reception of that play while still up in Macedon itself. Now let's bring it to Athens because here our story gets increasingly complex. We know it was performed in Athens in 405 after Euripides' death, and so we need to think about that historical context really, really quite carefully. We have to think about what the 
Euripides might have intended for it, when he writing the play, to be seen by an Athenian audience? What did he think and could know about, potentially, that Athenians would really uh, see in the play what would resonate with them? But also, I think we have to imagine that there were a whole series of possible interpretations that would have been there for the Athenian audience because of events that were dramatically happening in the months preceding the performance, which Euripides couldn't possibly have known about because, of course, by this stage, he was already dead. So there are multiple layers here of actual intention uh, and, uh, uh, with interpretation and then actually just a gathering set of historical contexts which would have left the audience on the day actually possibly seeing a whole new series of insights. So this is a play coming from outside Athens to Athens to be performed on the stage in the theatre of Dionysus. I'm a playwright writing it outside of Athens at the time. But it is not an unusual theme. You heard Xavier talking earlier about how often Dionysus is portrayed on vase painting and also on the stage. Right? Although not many are surviving to us today, we know that this theme, particularly surrounding many different Dionysiac myths, but also particularly the story of Dionysus has been, uh, and Pentheus, has been on the stage before. We know that Aeschylus, for instance, wrote a Pentheus. And we know that even just a couple of years before, a decade or so before, in 415, there was another trilogy that included a Bacchae. So it's not like Euripides is bringing a play that no one has ever thought about on the stage before to Athens. But it's about the particular moment that he's bringing this play to the stage and about the particular resonances that it might have at this particular time. And what might those resonances be? Well, let's think about this outsider question a bit more. How does Athens react to outsiders? We've already seen in the question of Macedon that there's definitely a group of who's in and who's out, who's Greek and who's not. But Athens had got even more particular in the decades before this play was put on. Athens is a democracy. We like to think about that democracy as being open and welcoming, right? Like us, supposedly, today. But actually, the Athenian democracy of the second half of the fifth century was getting increasingly insular. From 451, we know that laws were being passed in the Athenian democracy that was tightening the definition of citizenship to the exclusion of people who, who hitherto had been considered citizens of Athens. And this was particularly around who your parents had to be. After 451, both of your parents had to have been Athenian citizens for you to carry on as a citizen. And some almost 5,000 hitherto Athenians, as a result, lost their citizenship almost overnight. Through the second half of the fifth century, as a result, Athens will be increasingly vigilant about who it lets in to its privileged club of the Athenian democracy. And it, while it will have a substantial population of resident foreigners, the so-called metics working amongst it, right, they will be very distinctly politically separate from those who are actually in the Athenian club. Thus, the Athenians policed very carefully the boundaries of citizenship. And so in this play, when we see Pentheus and others reacting to these new arrivals from outside with suspicion, we must imagine an Athenian audience well used to this idea. In fact, an Athenian audience, don't forget, you are the Athenian audience of the play today. You are, when you're not in the theater, popping across to the political assembly place, the Panix, and voting yourselves individually in this direct democracy on these issues. You are the ones continuing to want and vote for this rather insular view of who can be part of the Athenian democratic society. So when we see a play in which there is suspicion about the arrival of somebody new, we must imagine the Athenian audience had some sympathy with that. When we hear Cadmus at the end of the play express his horror about the fact that his future now is exile, where he must go and settle in some barbarian land, we can understand that the Athenian audience would have a great deal of sympathy with that problem and issue. And then, of course, there is the war. A war that has been going on now for some time. A little bit like I suspect this banging noise is going to go on for some time. 
a war that has drained Athens of its troops, its men, its citizens, its resources, its pride, its empire. I told you so. And that began, if you remember your kind of Peloponnesian War story back in 431, with an abrupt start with the arrival of the plague in Athens, a plague that swept through the city and killed off a large percentage of the population, including, of course, eventually the great leader of the time, Pericles. One of the responses to that plague was the introduction of new cults. Athens is not, and the people in the audience in 405 would not have been themselves unused to the issues surrounding the introduction of new cults. Post the plague, one of the great new cults to be given a home right at the base of the Acropolis. You can see the Parthenon there at the center, and if we come to the bottom part of the map, just next to, in fact, the theater of Dionysus is this built sanctuary here, which was the sanctuary of Asclepius, who was given its first, his first official cult welcome, an official kind of sanctuary at the base of the Acropolis in direct response in the years after the plague had ravaged through Athens. Now, you might think, well, you know, there was a plague, Asclepius, god of healing, makes perfect sense, there's no issue here bringing in a new cult. But actually, bringing in a new official cult um, is a big deal. It's not something that happens lightly or that often. And it would have been a major point of debate and consideration. And it wasn't just Asclepius that was being brought in at this time. It's clear that the Athenians were looking around for different healing gods that might have some impact. So we know that other uh, gods from further afield that would have been more foreign and a little bit odder, people like uh, gods like Bendis, were actually given homes uh, kind of within the Athenian city at this time. Introducing new cults is an issue because it challenges the communal identity. Who are we? Who do we worship? How do we decide when to accept new people, new gods into our uh, world? Right? And we see how contentious the idea of introducing new gods could be if we look for a second into the comedies of Aristophanes that are coming out at the time. Because in this period, two of his plays, Birds and then specifically Clouds, look absolutely at this issue, poke fun at it, and at how damaging introducing new cults and being seen to introduce too many new cults can be. Because in clouds, Socrates, the great philosopher, is lambasted right, um, for um, trying to run, if you like, a kind of cram college that's advocating even the recognition of the clouds as new gods. You might think this is a comedy, right? That doesn't matter. But actually, dial forward to 399 BCE, when Socrates is on trial for, amongst other things, what was Socrates on, charge for, on trial for? Impiety, corrupting, corrupting the youth, and particularly worshipping the gods that the city doesn't officially acknowledge as part of the cult of the pantheon of gods they worship. Effectively, he ends up on trial, partly because he was dabbling with too many new gods. And in his defense, right, and in the pieces that have survived to us, uh, recounting supposedly what Socrates said both at the trial and afterwards, he actually points to Aristophanes' clouds, the play, as having thrown so much muck at him that some of it stuck and actually contributed to him ending up on trial. And we know where Socrates is going to end up in 399, He's going to be found guilty. There's all sorts of reasons, of course, behind that. But he's going to be found guilty, and he's going to be forced to drink hemlock and be executed. Introducing new gods or being seen to be outside the boundaries of the acceptable pantheon can be a very dangerous business. So the back idea is particularly relevant right here. You, that Athenian audience, I think would have understood Pentheus's skepticism about this new arrival, this new deity, this new worship coming in to the land. And have wanted to have had a much more regularized process of considered thought and introduction, rather than simply everyone being carried away by worship of him. So we've got the problem of introduction of new cults that would have been on Athenians' minds and which they'd been going through themselves as a result, particularly, of the plague that had come as the result of the war. 
but the war had caused other tensions within the Athenian democracy. Right? And that's the problem of ruler, of ruling. Now, you might think, hang on, Athens is a democracy, so it doesn't have a ruler. The people are the rulers. But, of course, we know that through that, process, that period of Athenian democracy, Athens had kind of favoured politicians, we might want to call them today, speakers, people who were looked to with a great, and who had a great deal of authority to sway the thinking of the Athenian democracy one way or other. There had been, of course, Pericles. Um, but after his death, there was a whole new generation of politicians ushered in that were thought to be, in many ways, quite different, more brash, often coming from, not from kind of traditionally elite families within Athens, but having worked their way up from the very bottom. In fact, as Plutarch want, recounts, one of these guys, Cleon, was said to have been the first to take his cloak off when he was speaking to the assembly. My God. What a change, right? This group of politicians, if we want to call them that, were vying with one another for political attention throughout this entire period after the death of Pericles in 429. Yes, they have moments when they emerge into the sun, but there's no one that has the same kind of single stranglehold on Athenian politics like Pericles did. And it's constant warfare. As a result, this Athenian democracy is looking at itself and seeing the problem of these new, very new in style and background, much more inexperienced rulers, or at least uh, kind of powerful speakers, who are attempting to hold sway over its democracy. And think about what the Bacchae is. At the end of the day, Pentheus is a man who is out of step with the rest of his community who want to follow the worship of Dionysus, but he is holding out. And many scholars have looked at the play at the result and seen it principally through that lens, that tension that comes when a leader has separated out from the group that he is supposed to be leading right? and the problems that come from that. And the Athenian assembly in the audience watching this play would have been living through those problems and they would have been only too well aware where they led to. Think back just less than a decade before this play was produced, Athenian democracy actually fell to the ground, to the dust, in the oligarchic revolution of 411, when it was chucked out entirely and only brought back, thankfully, after a short time by another kind of uh, democratic revolution. But it came back in a kind of even more brutal, even more aggressive form and as many of you may know, just a year or two after the Bacchae performed, it will fall again at the end of the Peloponnesian War to another political revolution um, and an oligarchic leadership for a short period. Combine that with some of your knowledge of the actual battles going on during this period of the Peloponnesian War. Think the Sicilian expedition happening again just a couple of years before this play is being produced and the problems of bad or good leadership in military terms that the Athenians were dealing with. And you can see why a play about actually how do leaders react to new problems? How do they interact with their communities, particularly when they're at difference with them? In this particular case, over the issue of the introduction of new cults, would have been an absolutely kind of fresh and sore issue for the Athenian audience having to sit and watch this play. And it's interesting to note, as you listen through it, that Pentheus is repeatedly described as young and inexperienced as a ruler through the play, something the Athenians were uh, worried about. Let's move on to think also about how the Athenians might have been slightly afraid of the East. Of course, Dionysus is coming to us from Lydia and from the east because we know, again, in the historical context that Persia is not completely out of the Peloponnesian War. In fact, Persia increasingly plays a large role in the Peloponnesian War as Athens and Sparta attempt to persuade Persia and particularly the satraps that are on the western coast of Asia to uh, sponsor one or the other. And in fact, we're at a period of time in the immediate aftermath before this play is performed when uh, Persia has started supporting Sparta. 
The Athenian audience watching this play knows that the East is not on their side as they watch a play about this new divine entry, specifically from, Idiot, from Lydia and from the East. And then, if we can, just really focus down into this period of 406 and 405. So everything I've been saying up to now, Euripides would have been well aware of. He would have been thinking potentially, as writing this play, I think, that these are interpretations, reverberations, ideas, that if this play is going to be seen in Athens, might well bite and hit home. But now we're getting into stuff that's happening in the immediate months before the play that Euripides could have had no knowledge of, because by now he is dead. And yet they add another layer, I think, to our understanding of what that Athenian audience might have had in their mind on the day. So in 406 to 405, which is where we're now concentrating ourselves, the Spartans have a major naval victory at a battle at a place called Notium, and the Athenians have to scramble a fleet to be able to fight back. Right? Um, they open up their citizenship lists, even to slaves, in order to have enough people to put into the battle. Think about kind of their reluctance to do that hitherto. They're melting down golden statues from across their city to pay for this fleet. And they create, magically, a fleet big enough to go up against the Spartans at the Battle of Argenuzai, which you can see on the right-hand side, just off the coast of the Persian Empire. Now, this ragtail Athenian fleet actually has an extraordinary victory against the Spartans and manages to crush much of the Spartan fleet. But following the battle, there is a great storm, and the generals, the Athenian generals, are not able to hang around and collect the Athenian war dead to bring them home for burial as they should. And when they get back to Athens, those generals are put on trial by the Athenian assembly and the Athenian assembly, in a rather illegal move, because it doesn't really have this legal power, decides to execute them. Military leadership, political leadership, political decisions, battles in the East, tensions of the democracy, all there in the months before, acutely in the months before this play. And at the same time, what does Sparta do, of course, but it turns back to its new friend Persia to ask for more money to rebuild a fleet, and it, in fact, reinstates one of its best generals rather than executing any of their own. So in the months before this play is produced, we've got Athens actually having made a series of calculated errors thanks to the workings of its political system uh, against, with its leaders, in a battle which has left it very much exposed thanks to the help that Persia is offering to Sparta. Now, the Bacchae is performed at the Theatre of Dionysus at the Dionysia in March time, 405. Just two months before, at the Lanaia Comedy Festival, 405, the January, Aristophanes is back, producing the frogs. Many of you might be aware of the similarity and overlap between the two, because we're looking at plays that both put Dionysus front and centre. Except in this play, Aristophanes is sending Dionysus down into the underworld to bring back Euripides, who's recently died, to help save Athens, because Athens is in such trouble. Dionysus in the frogs will get dressed up as Heracles and be a bit of a fool as he gradually learns his craft. You can start to see some of these similarities. But at this point, the Athenian audience won't have seen the back eye. And of course, at the end of the play, Actually, Dionysus ends up not picking Euripides, but picking Aeschylus as the person who can best help save Athens. Because in that play, what's needed is a return to the old ways of doing things that helped Athens out in the far distant past, not the more recent new ways of doing things. So just in these very months before this audience came to watch the Bacchae, you've got another comedy being put on which is offering up a completely different solution than the Bacchae will. In the Bacchae, of course, it's the new that triumphs. Dionysus and his cult is the winner. So I want to kind of, as I need to finish up now, leave you with that image of what you as the Athenian audience would have in your minds potentially having also been at the Lanaia a couple of months before in 405. All of those resonances, both of the long half century of Athens's development of its politics and its democracy, its insularity, then of the war and of the problems and issues that that had brought to the democracy, 
vis-a-vis -vis the introduction of new cults, vis-a-vis -vis the introduction and trusting of new, a new generation of leaders, vis-a-vis -vis Persia as friend or foe, vis-a-vis -vis their own recent decisions at Arganuzai and afterwards in the assembly as to what to do with the generals, and then that question about what to do next. Do we stick with the new? Do we embrace the new? Do we go with the new? Or do we run back to the old ways of doing things through the play? And in the aftermath of this play of the Baki being put on, four or five to four, we have tumultuous events continuing. The Athenians, now resplendent in victory after Organuzai, now face a new Spartan navy, which will comprehensively defeat them at Aegis Potomoi, up again at the top right, just off the coast of Persia. As a result, from that point onwards, Athens will gradually be starved into submission and to defeat. So we have a play with Baki that is absolutely at a turning point, written by somebody outside of Athens who had a series of potential interpretations in his mind when writing the play for Athens, but for which this play, when it actually came to be produced and seen, had an additional set of resonances. And obviously, also, we might think about post the production of Baki for Macedon, what would be happening up next in Macedon, and it's not a very good story there either because Archelaus will die in 399 BCE, and everything that he achieved to the good for Macedon will be absolutely destroyed by a period of anarchy in which Macedon will now have five kings over the next six years, and the subsequent rulers will get their, uh, their throne principally through assassination, not exactly the benevolent rulership um, that Archelaus probably had in mind. Thank you very much for your attention, and enjoy the day. Thank you.